Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to be reviewing Toni Morrison's Nobel lecture, her acceptance speech when she received the Nobel Prize for Literature. This is on page 217 in our um, textbook. I like to begin with the introduction. We can look at the third paragraph. She writes, in her acceptance speech reprinted here, she explains her work as a writer within the context of a well-known African folktale about a wise woman who is confronted by two children wanting to know whether a bird that one of them holds is living or dead. So this is very different than the other text that we've been reading in this module so far. It reminds me of Frederick Douglass's story, which was um, the one uh, we read in education, when learning to read, which was different than the other texts because so many of the texts we've been reading in this class are essays and philosophical texts and couple times here or there we're introduced to a story like Frederick Douglass's personal narrative of learning to read or Toni Morrison's Nobel lecture where she talks very personally and in the first person about her ideas about language and um, before I begin I just want to preface right the, this module is on language and so so far we've covered um, two different examples of persuasive language um, Athena trying to convince the Furies to not be furious with someone that they have been ordered to torture, essentially to go mad. And then we have Pericles' funeral, funeral oration where he addressed the, all of um, Athens uh, in convincing them essentially to sacrifice their lives, their sons for the country or the state at the time. And in the last lecture, I reviewed Aristotle's On Rhetoric, where he talks specifically about the, the relationship between the dialectic, which is our discovery of truth, and the rhetoric, which, which is how we teach truth, and that those things are both two sides of the same coin, and they have a very consistent relationship with each other, and they're really both necessary to each other, and he writes about how all discovery towards the dialectic and the rhetoric is actually kind of all discovery towards truth. In, in Toni Morrison's lecture, she uses a metaphor. She's an excellent writer, and I recommend you read her work if you haven't already. Um, her writing is very poetic, and so it fits that she would use um, what this author of the text writes as an analogy, but I like to refer to it more as a metaphor, or even like a conceit, which is an extended metaphor throughout a poem, similar to Paul Dunbarn's poem, Sympathy, where he writes, I know what the cage bird feels, I know why the cage bird sings. Um, so in this instance, the whole, the whole lecture is given in this, with this story of the bird and the wise woman and the two children who are really bent on proving that she's not who she says she is and who the town believes her to be for whatever reason they have. And so, um, let's begin at the beginning of her speech on page 217. She begins with the story. Uh, once upon a time, there was an old woman, blind but wise. Or was it an old man, a guru perhaps, or a griot, some soothing restless children? I have heard this story, or one exactly like it, in the lore of several cultures. So, uh, right away, she's, and, and I'm going to be kind of referring to Aristotle's rhetoric and the tools that he talked about persuasion when I'm talking about what Toni Morrison is doing here and, and how it's connected. Um, Right away, she's saying that the story she's about to use is not a very specific cultural story. For example, an African story. She's saying it, she's heard it in the lore, the folklore of several cultures, which means that it's the kind of story that can be applied to any culture, any time period. And that's really important because the audience she's addressing um, in accepting the Nobel Prize is a varied audience of different cultures, different religions, different ages, certainly academics, um, certainly scholars, but she really wants to do what Aristotle is talking about, putting putting the judge or your audience in the frame of mind to receive your message, right? So she's saying, I've heard this story in several cultures, so it's applicable to wherever you come from. The story is not based specifically just in one country or one culture. Once upon a time, there was an old woman, blind, wise, and she reiterates herself to kind of put us where the focus is on these two qualities of the woman. She's old, okay, so we assume that she has experience, maybe not necessarily education, but experience, and that has made her wise. And we talk about in class many times wisdom being different from knowledge, right? Knowledge being something you can accrue unlimitedly, and it's passive. It can just stay with you forever, and you never use it for anything. Um, but how our wisdom is where 
you are actively using your knowledge, what you know, you are living it out, you are applying it, however hard it is, however um, patient you must be, and however patient you must be with other people, um, you have to apply this knowledge. She writes, in the version I know, the woman is the daughter of slaves, black American, and lives along in a small house outside of town. I think it's interesting. I underline that the woman lives outside of town. Now, the reason I think this is important is because she lives separate from influence. She also lives separate from whatever trends are happening. She's an older woman, so she's probably attached to her ways and of life. And whatever is new and up and coming is not interesting to her because that's not wisdom, right? Wisdom is something that's everlasting and infinite. So she lives outside of town. She lives separate. And what, um, what, uh, what Tony says next is immediately what Aristotle said towards the end of my lecture on rhetoric and toward the ends of that text where he says probably the greatest um, tool that you have in persuading people is your own character. Um, because immediately if you're a person of good intention, um, people will know and they will trust you. And if you're a person of bad repute or ill repute, then people will doubt everything you say, even if it's the truth. And even if it's something they already know, right? They don't agree with you because they don't trust you. So she writes, her reputation for wisdom is without peer and without question. Among her people, she is both the law and its transgression, the honor she is paid and the awe which she is held reach beyond her neighborhood to far places away, places far away to the city where the intelligence of rural prophets is the source of much amusement. So she's considered a rural prophet, right? She's a woman living in the country, totally alone. And to people who would be in the city, like a metropolis where they're studying, where there's technology and science and advancement, she's a joke. Okay. But the, her wisdom reaches them to the point where even they are impressed. So it's set up that her character for wisdom, her reputation for being right is without comparison. Okay, so that's important to hear the story. And then she says, one day the woman is visited by some young people who seem to be bent on disproving her clairvoyance, right? Um, and showing up her for the fraud they believe she is. Their plan is simple. They enter her house. They ask the one question, the answer to which rides solely on her differences from them, a difference they regard as a profound disability, her blindness. Okay, so she doesn't have one of her senses. She can't see. And to them, this makes her less powerful than she is believed to be. They stand before her and one of them says, old woman, I hold in my hand a bird. Tell me whether it is living or dead. She does not answer and the question is repeated. Is the bird I am holding living or dead? Still, she doesn't answer. She is blind and cannot see her visitors, let alone what is in their hands. She does not know their color, gender, or homeland. She only knows their motive. And this is so perfect. Like this is the part in the text where you stop and you think about what Morrison is saying here, right? Motive cannot be seen. Motive can only be like used by our fifth sense, right? Our intuition, a kind of thing that you can't explain, but you can't see somebody's motive. You can't hear it. You can't smell it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. But of all of the faculties that she has, she has this intuition that counts for even more than the senses that most of us rely our lives on, right? So, and, and the word usage, the language, right? This whole module is about language. So even the word choice that Tony's using um, in the in the story is important. She knows their motive, okay? It says that she can't tell. She cannot see the visitors. She can't know for sure even if there's a bird in their hands, right? That's not even mentioned. I would, If it was me, I would be doubting if there's even anything in their hands because I can't tell. But she knows their motive is to try to disprove her. The old woman's silence is so long that the young people have trouble holding in their laughter. So they're laughing. And finally she speaks and she says, I don't know. I don't know whether the bird you are holding is dead or alive, but what I do know is that it is in your hands. It is in your hands. So they've come to her with a gauntlet, right? There's, they've, they've thrown the gauntlet down and they say, hey lady, here's a chance where you can prove us right or wrong. You save your reputation or you lose it. And what does she do? Like the wise woman she is, she pushes it back on them. She doesn't answer a question with an answer. I mean, with another question, because that's, that's bad. But, in, and that's kind of a cheap way to respond, right? It's a cheap way of eluding the question. And it doesn't show wisdom at all. It just shows cunning. But what she does do is she pushes the, an the answer back on them. And she says, well, you know what? You know whether it's dead or alive. I mean, you're asking a wise woman a simple, a stupid question, a, a question that doesn't require wisdom, 
right? And whether I could use, if I could see it, I would be able to answer it, <clears throat> whether I was wise or not, whether I was smart or dumb. Um, but she's saying it's in your hands. So what does Morrison say about what this answer means? It is in your hands. She says, her answer can be taken to mean if it is dead, you either found it that way or you killed it. If it is alive, you can still kill it. Whether it is to stay alive, it is your decision. Whatever the case, it is your responsibility. The greater implication of what this woman is telling these guys, these children who are coming here, however young they could be, they could be 10, they could be 17, they could be 23. She's saying, your decision to do what you do is in your hands, right? They didn't come to her with sincere thoughts of taking to her wisdom and running with it and saying, okay, whatever she says, we're going to do. Like she's a guru, right? They came to her to doubt whatever she said, okay? Because they're asking her a question that does not require wisdom. So they're setting to prove her wrong from the beginning. So the, her answer to the question doesn't matter. The blind woman shifts attention away from assertions of power to the instrument through which that power is exercised, which is their motive, which is their means and what they're doing, right? Um, speculation on what the bird in the hand could signify has always been attractive to me, she writes, but especially so now thinking as I have been about the work I do that has brought me to this company. So I choose to read the bird as language and the woman as a practiced writer. So now here we go as far as the metaphor, right? Or the analogy that she's using. The bird is language, okay? Whether it's alive or dead. And the woman, the wise woman, the blind woman is the writer. So I choose to read the bird as language and the woman as a practice writer. Being a writer, she thinks of language partly as a system. And this is super important. And this is something I was referring to in class as far as how language, we rely on it to be stable or else we cannot build civilization. Okay, back with the very story in the very beginning, we talked about the, the story from the Old Testament, the Tower of Babel or Babel, however you pronounce it, or however you want to pronounce it according to your culture. Um, the, all plans stopped the second that languages became diversified. They went from one language in that story to a multitude, and we have no idea how many. It could have been 70, it could be seven. But the people who stuck together, they only stuck together with people of their own language. And now they could no longer communicate or be a community with each other because language created exclusivity and inclusivity at the same time. It separated and connected at once. And this is what language is. And this is what Morrison is saying in the essay, that it's so double-sided. It's so powerful that it could do anything you want. It can connect and it can ab abolish. It can create and it can destroy. It can... It can build and it can break down, right? It can heal or it can hurt. So she thinks of it as a system. As a system, it has to be consistent, right? When we look at the 26 letters of the alphabet, we count on every day that we wake up, those 26 letters still make up our alphabet. If our alphabet changed every five years, there would be mass confusion. It would be hard to keep up. Projects would become um, stalled. Maybe they would become never finished. You know, we would never be able to build the cities and things that we built together if we couldn't rely on our language as a system that is fixed. Okay. Sure, there are changes to it. We adapt it. We change it. We've talked about the importance of denotation, right? The dictionary definition and connotation, which is the implied definition or the cultural definition that we have for words. So she thinks of language partly as a system. And then here's the other side, partly as a living thing over which one has control, but mostly agency. Now, what is agency? Agency is I make an act on my own agency of my own sound mind and body and then I bear the consequence of it. So she's saying three things. Number one, language is a system. Okay, that's super important. Number two, language is a living thing. That's super important too. And three, language has agency, which means language has consequences. Okay, so if I had a board behind me, I would write those three things. Language is one, a system, two, a living thing, and three has agency. And then we're gonna break that down. How is it a system? It's a system because it's fixed. We rely on it. The words, word, W-O-R-D, means word, right? The word title means title. The word woman means woman, okay? So those words are fixed. How is it a living thing? Well, sometimes um, a word changes, right? We use it for a different uh, purpose in the culture or we stop using it completely or what it used to mean, it doesn't mean anymore. Um, we add words, we create words, slang, 
Um, we bring old words back. Uh, English itself is such a melting pot of all the languages that we received. We have French influence, German influence, British influence, Scottish influence, um, uh, influence from Dutch. You know, we have so much, so that's why we have so many words in the English language. And so many words mean similar things and we have so many synonyms, right? It's a, so it is a living thing that it changes and it adapts. Okay, language certainly adapts. I mean, where did Yiddish come from? Yiddish came from the, you know, the Jews being um, influenced by Germans under concentration camps. Yiddish is 70 to 90 percent German, German words. So um, that's showing you the adaptability of language, how language can, you know, be markers of history for us. And third, that it has agency. And we know this all the time. We probably are more aware of this than the other two parts of language because every time I say something, it has consequences, right? We have consequence in our job, in school, with our families, in our personal relationships. We have consequence through text, the language that we use, through emails, right? We know that more than anything, that language has agency, it has consequences. So she thinks of language as susceptible to death, erasure, certainly imperiled, salvageable only by an effort of the will. For her, a dead language is not only one that's no longer spoken or written, like think of Sanskrit like that, it is unyielding language, content to admire its own paralysis. So language that is outdated or harmful or, or has uh, entered a stasis and is content to stay there, it has not evolved with the rest of us. It has no desire or purpose, and this is at the top of page 219. It has no desire or purpose other than maintaining the free range of its own narcotic narcissism. I love that term, narcotic narcissism. That's like loving yourself so much it's a drug to you. You get high off of your own self, right? Because narcissism is where you put yourself before anything else, and narcotic is something that is, um, it's a drug to us, right? It, it changes our, sen our senses, it changes our ability to reason. So narcotic narcissism is what a dead language is. Its own exclusivity and dominance. However, more abundance is not without effect for it actively thwarts the intellect, stalls conscience, suppresses human potential. So she's saying that the consequences of dead language are huge, right? Um, it's unreceptive to interrogation. It cannot form or tolerate new ideas, shape our thoughts, tell another story, fill baffling silences. What she's saying it is it lacks creative power. And by creative power, I don't mean creativity, I mean creation. You know, actual invention, innovation, the two parts of creation where you make something out of nothing or you make something new out of something old, right? The dead language does not yield creation anymore. And we as creatures, right, are very creative in and of, in and of who we are. This is how we are happy, right? Uh, next paragraph, she's convinced that when language dies, and she mentions possible ways language could die, out of carelessness, disuse, indifference, absence of esteem, or killed by fiat, not only she herself, but all users and makers are accountable for its demise. Um, let's go to the next paragraph, where she now talks about oppressive language and the power of language. Oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. Okay, so oppressive language is violent. It's not violent language, it is violence. Big difference, right? You can see the difference. Does more than represents the limits of knowledge, it limits knowledge. And I, and I believe this every day as a professor, I see that the, the language that my students use, it is either opening them up to new ideas or it is closing them off from anything. Um, whether it is obscuring state language or the faux language of mindless media, whether it is proud but calcified language of the academy or the commodity-driven language of science, whether it is malign language of law without ethics or language designed for the estrangement of minorities, hiding its racist plunder in its literary cheek, it must be rejected, altered, and exposed. Okay, so because language damages the people, the populace, the, the culture, it must be exposed and rejected and eliminated. Okay, that would be the order that I would put them in. Um, sexist language, racist language, theistic language. All are typical of policing languages of mastery and cannot, do not permit new knowledge or encourage the mutual exchange of ideas. So she names three specific languages. So number one, sexist language, right? Language that is derogatory towards a person because she is a woman, derogatory towards a person because he is a man, okay? Racist language. 
language that is derogatory or offensive or violent because of a person's race, the color of their skin or where they come from, right? Or theistic language. What is theistic language? Well, it is the language of religion, the language of the gods, okay? When we talk about gods, because all religion is exclusive. You cannot believe in one God and believe in another God. Believing in one God immediately excludes you from believing in all other gods, right? So theistic language, the language of religion is exclusive and can be violent to other people because of its exclusivity, right? Because it essentially claims I'm right, you're wrong, I'm alive and you're dead. And that's violent language to people. So theistic language is part of that grouping of sexist and racist language. All are typical of policing languages. Languages that serve to enforce what she would refer to as dead, worn out, or violent ideas. Okay, right, a police force enforces law, right? So a policing language is a language that enforces bad ideas or good ideas. So she's talking about policing languages that are enforcing bad, outdated, or wrong ideas. And cannot, do not permit new knowledge. Okay, so there's no room for creation there. There's no room for invention or growth even, right? There's no, there's no sun coming in, there's no light coming into that because it's just sealed. That language seals you off. And it does not encourage the mutual exchange of ideas, right? And we were talking in the last lecture with Aristotle how you have to be a reasonable person. That means number one in being reasonable is you have to be able to hear ideas that you patently disagree with and you can't jump and go insane. You have to hear ideas, you have to listen to people and you have to digest it, take time to receive it and interpret it, not responding back immediately right because then we start to fall into those policing languages okay when we're not being reasonable so she's talking about how language creates boundaries and in creating boundaries it creates environments how does it create boundaries and environments because language excludes some people and includes other people if you're on campus or if you're somewhere in a business office and there's a group of people who are speaking russian you are immediately excluded because you don't understand if there's a group of people speaking Spanish, if you speak Spanish, you're immediately included because you understand what they're saying. But if you don't speak Spanish, you're immediately excluded. So there's boundaries created. They're not physical boundaries. They're not walls that you can see, but they are very much real walls that we are kept in and out of, right? Through language. So let's jump to page 220, where she references the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babel. The conventional wisdom of the Tower of Babel story is the collapse was a misfortune that it was a distraction or the weight of many languages that precipitated the tower's failed architecture, that one monolithic language would have expedited the building and heaven would have been reached. Monolithic, again, that should be in your dictionary if you're hoping, hoping you're building your dictionaries. Monolithic means large, powerful, intractably indivisible and uniform. It cannot be separated. Something that is monolithic, if you cannot break it apart. If that thing falls, you gotta push the whole thing down. It's a monolith. Right, that's what a monolith is. One monolithic language would have expedited the building and heaven would have been reached. Whose heaven, she wonders, and what kind? Perhaps the achievement of paradise was premature. Had they, the heaven they imagined might have been found at their feet. Complicated, demanding, but a view of heaven as life, not heaven as post-life. She would not want to leave her young visitors, now we're going back to the story of the old wise woman, with the impression that language should be forced to stay alive, merely to be. Okay, language should not be alive just to be alive, right? It has to have purpose, it has to give creative power. The vitality of language lies in its ability to limn the actual, imagined, and possible lives of its speakers, readers, and writers. Limn means to put together, okay? The actual and the possible. The language is a bridge. Right? When I speak and you understand me, we are connected now. It's like an invisible bridge that I'm reaching you with. And that is exactly what reading does, what film does, the power of words, poetry, oratory, right? Just, just the connection of now you have ideas in your brain that were not there before. Why? Because you read them or you heard them. How? Through words. Black and white words. Two-dimensional words that have so much meaning to us, right? The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it will never forget what they did here. And she's referring to the president of the United States, um, talking about the graveyard that his country had become similar to the Pericles oration, right? His words signal deference to the uncapturability of the life it mourns. Sometimes language cannot fulfill the feeling, 
the sentiment or the uh, scenario or situation or ceremony, right? Sometimes silence is more powerful because there are no words. And so in a world filled with words, when you hold your words back, that's power too because you are creating a vacuum of words. You are creating a vacuum of language and then that silence is a lot of connotation of what that silence means. Right? So, so it's important to see that it's not just the use of words, not just knowing a lot of words and knowing how to use them, but knowing when not to speak, when you should not be using your language, when you should be listening or when you should just be pay reverence to something, to honor it. And I apologize for the jumping on the, on the screen. Um, and this is a great word. Um, I don't know if you know it, but I'm hoping you put it in your dictionary. She moves on to it, that um, the recognition that language can never live up to life once and for all, right? What words can really describe life? Even if I had a thousand pages in a book, even if I had 10,000 pages in a book, I could never encapsulate life with just words, right? Nor should it. Language can never pin down slavery, genocide, or war. Nor should it yearn for the arrogance to be able to do so, right? It's force, it's felicity. Felicity, what does that mean? It's the ability to find appropriate expression, appreciation, and intense happiness is in its reach toward the ineffable. Ineffable means it's something is so great, so extreme, that it cannot be described in words. Like love, right? When I refer to love, we talk about that in love, we use hyperbole. I'll move the mountains for you. I'm gonna die if you leave me. We have no other way to talk about love than huge exaggeration and cliches because love is the ineffable. Love is the thing that you cannot describe and you should not be able to describe it if it's really love. So, and that language is so beautiful because it reaches there. What is poetry? Poetry is using the least amount of words for the most profoundest ideas. So it's, it's, the, it's the mathematics of what language is trying to do, reaching the inexpressible, right? And that's why language is a living thing because it will always strive to reach the inexpressible in us. At the bottom and the top towards uh, 221, the choice word, the chosen silence, unmolested language surges towards knowledge, not its destruction. Language should be teaching knowledge. It should not be destroying. Language on its own as a system is meant to teach us, to grow us, to thrive us, not to destroy us. It is only us as like the people who hold the gun, right? Words can be pistols, they're bullets. So it's us who uses the words to hurt each other, but the words themselves should not be created to hurt or destroy. In, 220, in paragraph 20, are the very two important paragraphs I wanna point out on page 221. Word work, which is a great term, is sublime, she thinks, because it is generative, right? It makes meaning that secures our difference, our human difference, the way in which we are like no other like. And again, she is pointing to what Aristotle said on rhetoric, that we don't have to use our limbs to persuade people. We have our mouths. What Shin Tzu said, that education separates us from the beast, right? Our language is something that no other creature has. We have the power of a voice. We talk to each other as diplomats. We don't have to battle each other like lions. So she's saying, that this is our human difference, is our language, this is our pride. And then in the next is her whole thesis, which is just blows my mind. She says, we die. It's the shortest sentence of the whole essay. We die. And that may be the meaning of life. Now think about that. That the meaning of your life is that one day you're gonna die. That's just profound. Now this is the next. But we do language. I like the way she writes that we do language. Not that we have it, but we do it. It's an act. That may be the measure of our lives. You think about when someone passes away, we write an obituary for that person. We try to make a measure of his life in, in what, 50 words? When, when we have a speech like Pericles' funeral oration and we use the honorable dead to honor them, when we give a eulogy at a funeral service, we're using words to give honor. That's the measure of us. You know, I've been thinking lately about how uh, what Pericles said about uh, the s dead soldiers living on through the lives of those who speak about them, you know, that's how we live on. We cannot have immortality. It doesn't matter if you're a trillionaire. You're never going to buy immortality. And that's what everybody wants. 
So how do we live forever? Only in the mouths of others, in the words of the people after us, right? We walk in the dust of those before us and we live in the words of those after us. And that's how we become immortal. So that's how powerful language is, right? How are we still talking about Aristotle and Plato and Jesus and Muhammad and Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., right? Because of their words and our words. And we keep repeating what they said over and over and over again. And so those people are never really dead to us. Towards paragraph 25, nothing, no word follows her declaration of transfer, the silence of deep. Perhaps the question meant, could someone tell us what is life, what is death? Now she's trying to say that these children maybe were bringing to her a bigger problem than the bird. What is life? What is death? Can you sense life or death in my hands? Can you tell me what life or death is? Right? That maybe that was the bigger question. She's being generous, I think, at that point. On page 22 at the top, she says, your answer is artful, but its artfulness embarrasses us and ought to embarrass you. Your answer is indecence in itself. Congratulation. She's talking about us having a, a consciousness with a battle of heroines and heroes like you have already fought and lost, leaving us with nothing in our hands except what you have imagined here. That the, the youth, right, the people who receive, and again, this is the dialectic and the rhetoric, right? The dialectic is the wise woman. She knows the truth. The rhetoric is her passing it on to these kids. Do the kids want to know or not? Move to pay, uh, paragraph 30. Think of our lives and tell us your particularized word, world. Make up a story. Narrative is radical. A narrative is absolutely radical. You ask anybody who's ever been converted to a religion, I'll give you 99% of the time it was because someone told them how they felt being part of that religion. Testimony is everything. Narrative is radical, creating us at the very moment it is being created. When you hear words, you are being changed in real time. As you are hearing them, when you are learning, you are growing and changing as you are absorbing information. It is radical. It is dangerous. It is amazing. It is profound, right? It is so powerful. And it shows us how to see a life without pictures, without our senses, right? Because once you have knowledge, no one can take it away from you. And let's see how she finishes on page 223 in the last paragraph she writes. Finally, the old woman says, I trust you now. I trust you with the bird that is not in your hands because you have truly caught it. Look how lovely it is, this thing we have done together. If I was in a room alone, like in solitary confinement or that wise woman alone in the house and I just repeated what I knew to myself over and over and over again, I'll be saying the truth my whole life, but I'll never be learning anything new. We have to do it together. Education is about me saying what I know, you saying what you know, her saying she, what she knows, him saying what he knows, and all of us doing this thing together, right? And I wanna just end with what she writes. She says, we die, that might be the meaning of life, but we do language, that may be the measure of our lives.